let's talk about guilt by association first. So this happens in one of two ways in the video. Um, the first is kind of by analogy. So uh, talking a lot in the video about this super baddie um, Anita Bryant and kind of associating by drawing an analogy between Anita Bryant and JK Rowling, some superficial structural similarities between the two. Uh, therefore, we can kind of dismiss JK Rowling uh, for the same reasons that we dismissed Anita Bryant. Uh, let's just have a very quick look at that. Chapter one, Anita. The most famous bigot in American LGBT history is a woman called Anita Bryant. This is her story. So we get the whole first chapter dedicated to sort of telling about Anita's um, activism in the second wave against uh, a specific gay rights ordinance. Um, and then the second way the guilt by association tactic works is through focusing on uh, Kelly J. Keene as a sort of spokeswoman for the gender critical movement. So there's already a kind of guilt by association between J.K. Rowling and Kelly J. Keene. Um, and it's very interesting in this section, uh, the sort of gender critical views put in the mouths of a number of Republican politicians. So you can sort of see here in the thumbnails, there's uh, Trump uh, at a CPAC conference, uh, a number of others. Um, and then there's this kind of a litany uh, of the familiar accusations uh, that always sort of tend to get made on Twitter and on social media against Kelly J. Keene about her alleged links to the far right or to so-called uh, right-wing extremists. Um, and so, of course, then the move there is supposed to be, well, J.K. Rowling is associated with Kelly J. Keene through them both kind of being supporters of the gender critical movement. Kelly J. Keene is discredited by these alleged links to the far right. Uh, and so J.K. Rowling and the whole gender critical movement are thereby discredited as well. Um, and of course, it's notable that uh, everything that Wynne includes in this section of the video, kind of going through Kelly J. Keene's crimes, it's never her sort of, you know, polic, you know, committed sort of policy positions or what she actually stands for or wants. So, for example, at the moment, she's talking a lot about repealing the Gender Recognition Act in the UK. Um, but the things that are kind of covered in the video are all very small, like out of context screenshot from a long Facebook thread where we don't see the rest of the thread or this interview that she did once many years ago with someone who she didn't know who it was, right? So uh, that's kind of suspicious already off the bat that we're not hearing about the actual substance of the view or the arguments or the policy position or the legal change that's wanted or whatever else. We're hearing these kind of tiny things to do with, um, you know, alleged links with other people or uh, supposedly revealing of a terrible character or whatever else. So that's uh, strategy number one, guilt by, uh, guilt by association. Second point about the Mott and Bailey. So here is our castle that's usually used to uh, make this point. Um, the, the Bailey is this kind of front part of the castle that's not very well defended or would be kind of easy to attack. Uh, so the Bailey is the kind of controversial claim in an argument that is difficult to defend in the way that this kind of um, village will be difficult to defend from uh, invasion. Uh, and then the, the Mott, um, uh, this much kind of like uh, retreated, sort of easier to defend area of the castle, um, that's the kind of plausible claim. So the argumentative structure that is supposed to be sort of illustrated by this Mott and Bailey castle uh, depiction is that you have a very controversial claim that you assert and then when you're challenged you kind of retreat or walk it back uh, to this other uh, much easier to defend and less controversial claim. So if you like me find it hard to keep track of these two words which for me are meaningless uh, you can just think of the Mott as the plausible uh, claim and then the Bailey as the controversial claim. Okay, so here is uh, Wynne talking about J.K. Rowling's use of the Mott and Bailey. This is controversial, right? Calling trans women men who identify as women, calling trans men women. This is the Bailey in her Mott and Bailey argument. Trans women are men, trans men are women. That's the controversial interpretation of sex is real. Now, when accused of transphobia and facing backlash, 
Rowling walks the argument back and says, I'm being persecuted just for saying that women should be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. Women should be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. This is the obvious and utterly uncontroversial interpretation of sex is real. Okay, so she's attributing this sort of plausible claim or the mot to Rowling, we should be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. And then the Bailey, the much more controversial and difficult to defend claim uh, being that trans men are women and trans women are men. Now, I'm not going to make the point that uh, JK Rowling has never done this. Uh, I don't know if this is a fair accusation. Um, open question whether it's a fair accusation of some of the kind of online or social media strategies that some gender critical women use. Maybe that's fair, maybe that isn't. Uh, but one point that I wanted to make was that when herself uses this tactic in the video um, from her own argumentative perspective. So if we jump to 4225, like if this person doesn't think that trans women are men, trans men are women, is a transphobic statement, then what would they consider a transphobic statement? Okay, so for Wynn, um, I will say that the controversial statement is trans women are women and trans men are men. She's attributing this to gender critical feminists as being uh, transphobic if anything is. But then later in the video... Is it really hysteria? to react with strong emotions when your basic inclusion in society is up for debate? Aren't there certain situations where strong emotions are warranted? This is the bit that I wanted to talk about. So she says, is it really hysteria to react with strong emotions when your basic inclusion in society is up for debate? Um, so again, her Bailey, highly controversial assertion, trans women are women, trans women are men. And then her Mott, <laughs> the plausible argument that you can retreat to when challenged, uh, is um, this claim that uh, it's not hysteria to react with strong emotions when your basic inclusion in society is up for debate. Of course, trans people's basic inclusion in society is not up for debate by gender critical feminists. What is up for debate um, is this highly controversial claim uh, about changing the entire meaning of the previously sex gender terms man and woman and all the kind of ideology that comes along with uh, the various claims that are made by trans activists or gender, ident gender identity activists. So this is a kind of partners in crime um, type response. Perhaps it's true uh, that JK Rowling or other gender critical feminists use this Mott and Bailey argumentative strategy but it's also true that Wynn utilizes this exact same Mott and Bailey strategy. Um, and that if we were all being argumentatively honest, we would make our controversial claims and then try to defend them as best we can, rather than retreating to these kind of much easier to defend Mott's um, and not having the argument that's really the thing that people are invested in and, and that is important. Straw manning. Obviously, this video is a response to the Free Press's podcast, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Um, in Chapter 7 of uh, the podcast, Megan Phelps Roper, the host, puts a series of questions to J.K. Rowling. These are questions that Phelps Roper came up with as a kind of test on uh, how epistemically virtuous um, or sort of responsible her beliefs were. And I think what's most interesting is the third one of these. So uh, let me just play it to you in Phelps Roper's voice. Can you articulate your opponent's perspective in a way that they recognize? Or are you straw manning? And I think that's excellent. And I genuinely believe I could articulate my opponent's position. So that's Phelps Roper putting the question to J.K. Rowling and J.K. Rowling responding that she thinks she could articulate the trans activist or gender identity activist position. But we can ask that same question of when. Um, does Wynne manage in her response video to articulate the gender critical position in a way that gender critical feminists would recognize? Um, so let me just play the little bit of the video quite close to, to the end in the final chapter, chapter seven, uh, where she sort of sums up her take <laughs> of gender critical feminism. It's a movement that has no beliefs apart from a shared determination to reduce the number of trans people. 
Okay, so um, <laughs> perhaps not a highly charitable uh, assertion, um, uh, a shared determination to reduce the number of trans people. And what I would just say here is, um, again, as I've mentioned earlier in the video, you know, we have these two chapters about Anita Bryant. Obviously, that has nothing to do with gender critical feminism. This is a figure from um, sort of second wave of feminism type period. Um, uh, we have a lot of discussion uh, of, of J.K. Rowling in particular and certain things that she has said. We have some discussion of her uh, um, what guilt by association with Kelly J. Keene and things Kelly J. Keene has said. We don't really at any point have a discussion of what the heart of the ideology or theory of gender critical feminism is. And so we don't get any substantive response to the philosophical um, uh, or otherwise kind of theoretical belief type claims of the movement. And would it have been possible to do that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> she could have read uh, and responded to Julie Bindle's book, Feminism for Women, Kathleen Stock's book, Material Girls, Helen Joyce's book, Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality, Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, Lisa Salen Davis's book, Tomboy, Kara Dansky's book, The Abolition of Sex, or my book, Gender Critical Feminism. So there's no shortage of available material uh, to give a charitable steel manning, which means making the strongest version possible of your opponent and responding to that or attempting to argue back to or object to that. She could have done that with any of these books and countless other kind of articles, um, uh, videos, interviews, podcasts, and so on available online from thoughtful, careful, gender critical women. Uh, but she didn't. <laughs> and I think that is, uh, that is revealing. People versus ideology. Here we need to look at the start of chapter four, uh, which Wynne calls Joe Rose transphobia. Let me just play you uh, sort of a minute or so of that. Chapter four, Joe Rose transphobia. That's it. I'm going full Slytherin. In episode five of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Joe Rowe compares trans activists to Death Eaters, the fictionalized fascists in Harry Potter. My position is that this activist movement, in the form that it's currently taking, echoes the very thing that I was warning against in Harry Potter. The Death Eaters claimed we have been made to live in secret, and now is our time. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. When an article then claimed she had equated trans people to Death Eaters, the podcast's PR firm reached out demanding a correction because she only equated the movement to Death Eaters, not trans people in general. Yeah, I don't hate marginalized people. I just hate it when they advocate for themselves. So I do have to be very careful with my wording here, lest a defamation letter arrive by owl. <laughs> Okay, so the important uh, sentence here is, um, yeah, I don't hate marginalized people, I just hate it when they advocate for themselves. Uh, and so this is um, the distinction that I wanted to make between people versus ideology, right? So what Wynne is doing here is trying to claim that um, all trans people are doing is trying to advocate for themselves as a group, uh, and so that it would be disingenuous for anyone to oppose that advocacy uh, while sort of claiming not to have any problem with the group. I don't hate the group, I just hate uh, their advocacy for themselves. If you put it like that, it sounds worse, but I think we should, can and should make a meaningful distinction between the people at issue and then the various kind of ideology slash theory that may or may not be associated with them. And it might be associated with them by outsiders, it might be associated with them by certain activist con contingents within that group. It might be highly controversial according to the group itself. It might not be. Um, it might be a liberation ideology. It might not be. Uh, so I put this um, question a few years ago to a bunch of philosophers and kind of crowdsourced a bunch of examples. Some of these are more controversial than others. Some of them would kind of need more uh, talking through and unpacking. But just to kind of give you the flavor of this, I've tried to separate three categories. One is whatever the social group is. So what people are we talking about? 
then we have sort of more and less controversial theories or ideologies or sets of beliefs and ideas that can be associated with that group, in some cases more politically and in some cases less. And then we have the kind of accusation that's associated with disagreeing with that ideology, usually relevant to the people. So let me just give you a couple of examples so you kind of get the flavor of it. The thought would be, for example, there are Jewish people, some of whom um, support or kind of believe in and endorse Zionism as a sort of theory or ideology or kind of political, uh, it's called political ideology. Then the accusation would be that you can't disagree with that theory or ideology without being an anti-Semite. And a lot of people will want to reject that claim and say, no, the ideology is separate from the people. You can support and respect any people while disagreeing with the substance of this theoretical claim. Likewise for women, say you disagree with liberal intersectional feminism, um, that doesn't make you necessarily a sexist or a misogynist, you might just think that there are serious problems in the theory. And of course the example that's actually at stake for us is trans people as a social group currently having gender identity ideology uh, being pushed by some of their activists and allies, and the thought being that you can in fact push back on that theory and ideology without actually being a transphobe. So again, you're welcome to sort of look through this list and maybe you think some of these are stupid <laughs> and unconvincing and some of them are sort of more convincing. Um, uh, so I think some of these examples are things that various people who contributed had experienced being called, you know, so being an academic who advocates for a limit to population growth and then being accused of being a racist or eugenicist, for example. So this is just to say and to kind of assert, I think, that um, this is a very common political strategy to sort of conflate the people of a group with these sorts of theories that may be more or less extreme or more or less radical, um, and to kind of insist that whenever you disagree with the theory or reject the theory, you hate the people. And it's important to see that that's just a political tactic. And it's a great tactic, because if you can insist that that is the case and make people believe it, you more easily get to push your ideology through. And that's great for the activists um, in the group in question. So I think all that is happening with gender critical feminists is that they are really disagreeing with and resisting gender identity ideology. And this strategy is being applied to them. They're being accused of transphobia because of the association between that theory or ideology and trans people. And it's just as implausible in this case of trans, uh, gender identity ideology and transphobia as it would be in any of these other cases. Tactics. So chapter six of Wynne's video is called Illiberal Methods. Chapter six, Illiberal Methods. One of J.K. Rowling's core complaints about the trans rights movement is she sees it as illiberal in its methods. Let me just say first how annoying it is that Wynne is wearing a Lavender Menace t-shirt, which is a second wave lesbian group pushing back against the perceived lesbophobia of mainstream feminism, in particular associated with Betty Friedan. Um, irritating indeed, not a lesbian. Okay, moving on. Wynne's point in this section is that J.K. Rowling accuses the trans activist movement of using illiberal methods. And there's uh, two kinds of threads running through this. One is about the sort of no debate tactics of the trans activist movement. And another is when kind of making the claim that um, historical movements haven't just utilized debate. So they haven't just patiently waited to persuade everyone and change everyone's mind. Rather, they've often used um, violent tactics or sort of civil disobedience, all sorts of other strategies to sort of push for um, political change. And I guess the thing to say back just quickly here is that there is some illiberalism because even the movements in the past that were also using these further um, social movement kind of disruptive tactics, they were also engaging in debate and persuasion. So I don't think we have a comparable social justice movement that just decides in advance on a very controversial set of um, moral and political beliefs uh, backed by sort of pseudoscientific claims and then just flatly refuses to debate them uh, but uses those political tactics to kind of get them entrenched and I think that's probably the illiberalism uh, that JK Rowling is pointing to. 
But I think another thing to say, and maybe what Rowling could have said is, the question of the tactics being justified is a question about when the social movement has a just cause. So when a social movement has a just cause, as feminism historically has had, and as the civil rights movement has had, then we kind of up our threshold on what we think acceptable tactics are. And of course, there's always going to be controversy at the very upper threshold when we're talking about things like serious civil disobedience, um, damage to property, potentially violence being used against other persons. But when the movement is completely unjust, so we think that it's not a valid social movement, lacks a just cause, is demanding things that, you know, really a reasonable person can, res can resist and should resist, then of course we're not going to think that those tactics are justified. And of course we're going to have an objection to the idea that there should just be no debate. So some activist group can just decide by fiat um, on this set of extremely controversial propositions that involve really radical change to uh, sort of our concepts and our language and the politics of other groups like lesbian and gay people and women um, and just kind of insist on all of that, um, uh, yell no debate and then kind of use these disruptive tactics to move the politics forward. I mean, that's like nothing but just kind of banging your fist on the table uh, and saying that you're right. The last thing I wanted to talk about is transphobia. And this is a slightly more concessive section of the video in the sense that I think Wynne asks a fair question uh, and that there's something for gender critical feminists to talk further about um, in the sort of uh, process of answering uh, uh, her question. So let's just have a look at that bit of the video. I'm not going to argue anymore about whether JK Rowling is transphobic because anyone who believes in transphobia can see that obviously she is. The question now is whether transphobia is the sort of thing that progressives can denounce, the way we at least aspire to denounce racism, misogyny, and homophobia. That's usually what we're talking about when we talk about J.K. Rowling, right? Whether it's fair to cancel her. That's what the witch trials of J.K. Rowling is about. The Rowling debate is a proxy for a larger question. Is transphobia a legitimate viewpoint worthy of polite consideration and respect in liberal humane society? Or is it just an ugly prejudice that we can justifiably react to with scorn and condemnation? So one thing that went down a little earlier here is she sort of clips uh, Kelly J. Keene denying uh, that there is any such thing as trans people. Correspondingly, there can be no such thing as transphobia. So if there is no group, there can be no um, discrimination or phobic attitudes toward that group. Is, do you believe that transphobia is a legitimate concept? What are some examples of statements that you would consider transphobic? Because many of them don't believe that transphobia is a valid concept because they don't think that trans people are a legitimate minority. Right? There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. There are people that call themselves these things that may have other issues manifesting that then make them think they're this but no we have to stop using any words like transgender there may be more words that we have to say in order to say that we may call it transgender ideology uh, but when it comes to a person they may be following transgender ideology but they are not transgender there is no such thing as a man or a woman being anything other than a man or a woman so um, I don't think Kelly J is going to get out of it that easily, right? So even if we take her view that there's kind of no such thing, meaning something like no real difference in the world that this social category is tracking, uh, we might still think, well, the people who think that they belong to that category or the people who other many other people or some other people accept belong to that category, the people who use that word, even if the word is empty, However you want to fill that in, there might still be a question of mistreatment of those people or discrimination against those people. So I think Wynn is still right that there would have to be some answer to the question of what does, now we're, maybe we need a new word, right? So if, if Kelly J doesn't want to talk about trans people, she won't want to talk about transphobia. Um, but we're going to need some word to account for uh, discrimination against people thought to be trans in her terms. So I don't think we get out of it just by kind of denying that there's any uh, so social group there or, or sort of thinking about the underlying kind of reality of that social group.
for those of us who think there is such a thing uh, as as a trans person and of course we can argue about you know how broad that group is and whether the sort of expansion of that group over time is something we, we want to accept or maybe we want to stick with a narrower concept of trans something like transsexual we should still figure out um, what we think transphobia consists in so that we can uh, identify it if, it if it shows up in our own movement and so we know the difference we're clear on the difference between advocating uh, gender critical feminism or criticizing the ideology of gender identity um, that line between criticizing the ideology and then in fact tipping over into criticizing the people so what I kind of would say instinctively, although I'd be really happy to hear from people about this um, point, we can talk on Twitter or uh, in the comments on YouTube, um, my sort of instinct would be to say it's something like um, generalizations. That's something that we can borrow from thinking about um, uh, things like uh, sexism and misogyny, racism, homophobia, and so on. So if we ever think that there are negative traits of some members of the social group and we generalize them to all members of the group just in virtue of being members, so we think there's something that is negative about uh, all gay people, for example, I think if we thought that about trans people, this negative generalization of negative traits from some to all, that would be a good example of transphobia. Um, we might also want to talk about whether what might count as transphobia is a kind of projection of behavioral um, or attitudinal uh, type traits uh, onto trans people as if by nature. And again, this is kind of corresponding to thinking about sexism and misogyny, or at least how, how some feminists, in, including myself, think about sexism and misogyny uh, as though women have a kind of distinctive nature um, or set of aptitudes and talents and sort of behaviors and so you can generalize from someone being a woman to this idea that all women will be like that and that's a separate point from thinking that there are averages of course so it may be statistically true that there are averages and yet false that in virtue of being a woman uh, this individual woman is is will be <laughs> will be guaranteed to be this way so again if we made that same move for for trans people assuming that there was a kind of nature to all people in virtue of being trans, whether that was negative or positive or kind of neutral, uh, that might be another thing that would count as transphobia. So I think that is a conversation that we can, uh, we can take up um, and it would be interesting to, to talk more about.